what we need as humans are these wake-up calls. Yeah. And mm -hmm. and it sounds like even I'm I, I want you to fill in the blanks here, but the thing about appreciating life that I was able to be mobile, it's like we often think that it's the big stuff, right? Oh, that I was able, you know, I think about the big trips I took or the fantastic events that I did, but often it's even just the little mundane things we take for granted that, mm -hmm. you know, being able to get up and go sit outside in the backyard yeah. or to go for a little walk or to go and have a cigar, like something that just makes you feel alive. That's just seemingly small, but yeah. that we missed because those are the day-to-day -day little things, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And Welcome to Old God Talks to Me, a podcast dedicated to helping guys create kick-ass lives for themselves and those that they love. Ladies, if you want to know what your guy is thinking, this podcast is for women too. Each week, a special guest helps you create that life you've imagined. We talk anti-aging medicine, personal growth, relationships and hot sex. Yeah, you hear me, getting laid more frequently other guy vices, and topics that many don't want to talk about but need to. Just because you're getting older doesn't mean you have to be old. Don't want to miss anything? Be sure to subscribe, share, rate, and review this podcast. And be sure to go to www.thestandard.academy forward slash magazine and grab a free copy of our new digital magazine. The Standard Academy, where we talk about erogenous zones, growing hair back, and other things that will help you create that kick-ass life. Now get ready to listen up and share with friends. This is Orange Official Old Guy at OldGuyTalksToMe.com, a podcast dedicated to helping older guys create kick-ass lives for themselves and those that they love. That's right, those that they love. And uh, I got today with me Jody Wellman, who's got this thing called 4,000 Mondays. That's right, 4,000 Mondays. Uh, and we're going to get into that a little bit. But I just, I just did a quick calculation here this morning, and I have used up 3,640 Mondays, uh, which means I'm 70, or I'm soon, soon be 70. And I, based on my calculations and, and the my wife shudders at this thought when I talk, tell her that I, I expect to live till about 120. Uh, I've got 2,600 left. Uh, <laughs> she says, another 50 years with you? Oh, shit. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we'll be celebrating our 30th anniversary here soon. So, uh, so I just did that little calculation. And uh, so, Jody, uh, welcome to the program. Well, thank you. I'm excited to be here. And uh, I like your optimism about 120. We, we need to redo our 4,000 Mondays math for you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, and, and for, for a lot of people generally, and I know life expectancy went down uh, by mm -hmm. a couple of years, uh, statistically speaking. Yeah. But, uh, and I, I spent, a, if, if you look at the uh, um, my podcast, uh, my guests, I spent a lot of time in the, uh, they call it functional medicine. I yeah. call it anti-aging because whenever I say functional medicine, no one knows what the hell I'm talking about. Uh, but I spent a lot of time in the anti-aging space. And, you know, it's not just the longevity. It's the quality, too, that that uh, a lot of doctors in this space with all, you know, stem cells, peptides, uh, uh, hormones, testosterone, all that stuff, uh, improve the quality of life. And I'm, I'm a great believer. And I've mentioned many a time, I've been on testosterone optimization for over 25 years. Yeah. And, uh, you know, way before they had started, you know, have all these clinics and my, my primary care doctor and I had arguments about this. And I didn't arguments. He tried to tell me like, oh, or so, you know, you're going to get prostate cancer. Your, your, your balls are going to shrivel up and your dick's going to fall off and all sorts of things. You're going to die of heart disease. I said, I said, that just doesn't sound right. Uh, so, <laughs> so I, I, and, and Jody, I, I, I guess you can tell I, I, I don't have much of a filter. Um, <laughs> so uh so let, let's get let's get into this a little bit so you have the saying and uh and by the way uh I, I will tell you we're gonna have all her contact information uh social media posts and uh her website in the uh, notes section so don't have to worry about writing it down uh, and i'll tell you her website's really fantastic i spent a little time on it in prepping Thank for you. a call and it, it's really got a lot of good stuff on there so what does Memento Mori translate into? Ooh, it is an old school Latin phrase. And it means 
remember we must die. And it's been going around for literally centuries. Mm -hmm. And, you know, back in the day, people wanted to remember they were going to die so that they could live good lives so they could get into whatever kind of heaven they, they, that, you know, they were supposed to be trying to get into. But for the most part, it was always a respect the sanctity of life because it ain't going to last forever. And so, you know, nowadays, um, not many of us are aware that that is a concept. And mm -hmm. my mission in life is to bring it back, you know, wake us sure. up to this fact. You know, so for example, like I have a memento memory coin that I carry with me everywhere that has a little skull on it. And it's oh, meant you get to that, do, you pardon get me? That, is that, did you get that made? For you know what? No, you can buy these things. Uh, there are various types and styles online. Um, I have a bunch of them. Like I kind of want them every time I open my purse or a drawer or in an old coat, coat pocket, I want them everywhere to remind me, oh gosh. It ain't, it ain't going to last forever. So let's make it last. Let's make it good while it lasts. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So what is, um, you usually talk about a concept called temporal scarcity. You want to yeah. get into that a little bit? Sure. Well, that's actually the legitimate side of memento mori, you know? So memento mori was sort of the ethos from way back when that many of us still carry. But temporal scarcity is at least where science took it and made it legit. So okay. temporal scarcity applies to a bunch of different domains, but picture this, anytime you take something and you make it, you say, look how rare it is, look how temporary it is, it's not going to last forever. Then all of a sudden our perception of its value just like skyrockets through the roof. Sure. And so that's true of, you know, <laughs> valuable, precious gems, um, you know, going fast, you know, um, in the store when you're trying to buy something, but it's totally true for our lives, mm -hmm. right? And because we, we do this bizarre thing. And this is the thing I've always found fascinating in studying psychology is that while we are conscious that we know we're going to come to a careening end, mm -hmm. we do a very good job of avoiding it, of course. Otherwise, we sure. wouldn't be able to be functioning adults without like daily existential crises. Mm -hmm. And that's a good thing, right? Uh, I don't want us to get consumed by this so that we catastrophize about it daily. We can talk about how to use it well rather than, you know, to, to create anxiety. But because we know that there is an end, it's fascinating to me that we do take life for granted, that we do get into these ruts and we kind of get into autopilot. And I don't know if you do. I mean, you, I, I listen to your podcast. I know the bit I know about you, like you seem to live life like you mean it. Do you find autopilot sometimes takes over? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, then, uh, first of all, I, I, I think that uh, my persona is actually, um, uh, <laughs> a little bit of that persona <laughs> because we all have our we all have our struggles we all have our our autopilot moments we do have you know the things that we do that we don't really pay attention to we just kind of kind of just go through life yeah. and the point is to uh is to not to not and i i recently had a uh, and i know you talk about this and maybe this, this is a uh, maybe a good time where you have um how near death experiences mm -hmm. affect you <laughs> and I, I did not have a near death experience. Actually, I, I, because I think I'm going to live till 120, yeah. I, I actually feel a little bit immortal in some respects. And, that, and that's good and bad. Uh, but I did have, um, and I've, I've talked about this, I had an ostomy yeah. at, the beginning, at the beginning of this year. And I don't know if you know what that yeah, is. Yeah, I remember you saying that. Yeah. Well, yeah, and, well, I learned about it through, your, through one of your yeah, recent podcasts. Yeah. And, and so that was a incredibly life altering uh, hmm event that really uh, because of certain issues with the ostomy um, I became uh, to a certain extent homebound mm. uh, depressing my, my mornings uh, were consisted of for, for those of you who don't know what ostomy is uh, basically they, they separate your intestine uh, from your colon and they they basically create a hole in your stomach and you shit through your stomach mm. and mm. so you so you have no control when that happens okay Okay, so so uh, my mornings for about three weeks consisted of, of me literally in bed for about two to three hours, shitting on myself. Yeah, and then my wife cleaning it up. And so it wasn't. And, in, can I just be? Can I get specific? Because yeah, well, no, I did. I, I, did two, I, I did two podcasts. On it, so I, I, <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, we will revisit. But um, okay, so go keep no, going. No, no, okay, no, no, no. You had a question. No, no. What was your question? Well, um, I guess I thought that it was in a bag. I thought it was very contained, but it was obviously something. Well, we couldn't more. get the bag to stick. Oh, God. and we went to all sorts. Of, you know, we went to several uh, uh, wound healing clinics that you know. There's all oh, this guy. You know, these people can show you how to get. It. We just couldn't get it to stick. 
Got it. And and so that that was the issue. And then finally, found, finally, after like going to place to place to place to place, we finally mm-hmm. found someone that was actually could show us how how to how to get it to stick and stay. Okay. And then and, and then so and then of course that that was that was a big relief because you know, also okay yeah okay so now I can leave the house. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and then eventually and then eventually several months later I, I got put back together again. Yeah. But it really made me appreciate. Uh, you know, what I, what I existed like before. Oh, that's so well said. Cause, and, and I'm sorry you had to go through that. It obviously sounds super shitty, pun intended, but it did it, No one wants that to happen. Right. And yet sometimes that's what we need as humans are these wake up calls. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. and it sounds like even I'm, I, I want you to fill in the blanks here, but the thing about appreciating life that I was able to be mobile, it's like, we often think that it's the big stuff, right? Oh, that I was able, you know, I think about the big trips I took or the fantastic events that I did, but often it's even just the little mundane things we take for granted that, Mm -hmm. you know, being able to get up and go sit outside in the backyard or to go for a little walk or to go and have a cigar, like something that just makes you feel alive. That's just seemingly small, but that we miss because those are the day-to-day little things, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, having a cigar, uh, you know, uh, just you know, as going out, you know, just yeah. just going out, and yeah. it all it also uh, uh, not to be morbid, yeah. uh, but we can go it's down me. that road for a little bit. Uh, yeah. I really intellectually understood suicide. Really? Yeah, because uh, I knew that I was going to get put back together again, mm-hmm. but it was really uh, one of the most emotionally, physically, and spiritually challenging times I had. Mm-hmm. But you see these people, you know, like the, you know the the wounded uh, military pe- personnel, you know, you know, they, you know their, their legs are gone or their arm is gone or whatever, and mm-hmm. and that's their life. Mm-hmm. It ain't going to get any better. That mm-hmm. is their life, mm-hmm. and I could see how you could get so worn down by it. <clears throat> that yeah. you say, I just don't want to get up. I don't want to do another day like this. And I, and I really understood it intellectually. And I, in, in, and I was like, you know, it just gave me a, a real appreciation of uh, being whole. Yeah. Yeah. You're highlighting so many fascinating things. First of all, ugh, that you had to go through that. And yet, and yet um, you know, because this is the work I do uh, with individuals and groups and so on is like, is that Ooh, there is something special here that because you've come through on the other side, mm. that that appreciation for life sounds like it is now so much in a, a savoring spot for you compared to where it was, you know, yeah. whether you'd say you officially took it for granted or not before, but now to realize that you're far probably from <laughs> certainly from suicide zone, but of that, it sounds like you have most of your life back. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But you know, I admit to being kind of conflicted while you're talking because there are, there is a school of thought, space and research about how we adapt in life. And so there's something called a hedonic treadmill. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but no. um, it's this idea that we adapt to things, even the things that make us happy, we get used to them. So we have oh, this yeah. notion that, you know, I'm going to want to get the new car and, oh, I'm going to have this fabulous trip and I'm going to marry this special, like, like the, this is going to make me happy. But then once we get the new car, it's like the new car smells going to wear off. Like we're going to adapt to it. It's just going to become ho-hum again. Right. Mm-hmm. And so what is fascinating about research, and I'll come back to that if you want, but it's like the flip side is true about adaptation that they actually say in studies that not only do we adapt to the good stuff, but we do adapt to the bad stuff so much so that we have this happiness, almost like a set point where people who have become paraplegics over six to 12 months, they generally come back to baseline where they were. People who won the lottery, who think my life has changed forever. They're high, but they generally come back down to wherever well, they, their they, set point they was. And up, so they end up broke most of the time again. <laughs> right, with really tacky <laughs> houses, yeah. So I, you know, part of me thinks, oh shit, like, Technically, you would adapt, but uh, you know. So I'd like to your thought on that because it could be about give it a little time, and you're, you'll come back to your usual self, maybe without some mobility, and maybe with a lot less shit around you. Um, but then yeah. I also want to respect that your will to live can diminish if you don't get to do the things that matter to you. 
Yeah. I think, you know, I, I think you're true. I think a lot of times we can adapt. I mean, people adapt to all sorts of horrible conditions uh, and, and, and that becomes their, their new normal. Uh, but you, you look at the, at the rates of, of suicides and things like that, and they're definitely higher uh, in, in that group. And so, so some people have an ability to adapt and others don't. So I think it's, it becomes a very individual thing. Uh, but for me, at that, at, with the ostomy, uh, my, what drove me was my fear of becoming decrepit. Mm -hmm. and and so that was uh i spent a lot, a lot of time because you see older guys get um you know you see you see them in the gym <clears throat> they're doing great this and that and next thing you know you, you see them uh, maybe a few weeks later and they're just a, a shadow of themselves and something's something's mm -hmm. happened in their life uh yeah. you know so, and and they become uh, uh you know they become just really almost you know they, they don't have the life that they had in their in, in anymore and that's really right. kind of the, the thing but actually that's kind of that's we actually that was kind of what we were talking about was uh healthy and unhealthy coping you know what would yeah. and, and we can't just briefly on that but you want to talk a little bit about more about how do you healthy co coping and unhealthy coping <laughs> let's start with unhealthy because that's where we go uh -huh, sure right? <laughs> you know when the going gets tough, so AKA uh, <clears throat> life, like serving it up to us on the regular, most of us are wired naturally. We'll either, you know, it's the fight, flight, freeze scenario. And in a world where we love to have the feeling of control over our situation and we don't always get it most of us, our first instinct isn't to stop and say, how do I want to deal with this in a way that when I look back on it, I will feel proud of myself or should I go to therapy and process this really unfortunate thing going on to me right now? Like the fear of losing my vitality because I am ill or, or, or all the things. So many of us do end up coping in ways that are actually totally freaking counterproductive, right? Like I work with people daily who, you know, they will immerse themselves in work because busyness is a really fantastic thing. I do this too, you know, like the, the cult of productivity. Um, if I just keep producing, then that's my perceived self-worth that gets to feel boosted. And then I get to ignore the fact that, you know, um, my boss actually, uh, I don't think I'm going to get promoted or, you know, for example, with me, I wasted a decade of life to eating disorders that, you know, I now see with the clarity I didn't in the moment that I was just, you know, trying to, trying to control lots of stuff going on around me with work and trying to feel control it um, in a way that I would never get by like, you know, binging and purging ain't going to solve nothing. It's only gonna make it worse. So many of us are actually just, the, it, it is a, dare I say, a normal response to find something that whether it turns to an addiction like food or gambling or sex or alcohol or fill in the blanks, including work mm -hmm. or whether it is just avoiding the thing. Like many of us, I'm going to bring all, all roads lead back to the Grim Reaper with me, honest. but that, mm -hmm. you know, we'll also, when we start to kind of think about the idea of the fact that we're going to die, we conveniently just slough it aside and don't go there so much so that most people don't have a will, don't have a living will, don't have things lined up because I just sure. la, 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 don't want to think about it. <laughs> so yeah, coping healthfully is about facing reality and being willing to feel the feelings you do not want to feel. Yeah, absolutely. Do you need accountability? Are you looking to change the course of your life but have failed to keep on track? Too often we take in information and fail to act. Do you need an accountability program to stay the course? Then go to www.thestandard.academy and find out about my accountability program that goes with my course that helps you find out what you want, why you want it, and how to get it. The accountability program keeps you on track to get results. Absolutely. And, and those feelings that you don't want to feel are often ones you need to deal with in order to, to move on and, and be better. Yeah. Um, how important is purpose to living? Oh, whoa. It's such a heavy hitter. Like it, it is such a heavy hitter. It can't be denied. Uh, there's really cool research out there that people who have a sense of purpose, like my life has some kind of meaning and I have a reason for waking up. And let's come back to that in a second because it does not need to be massive, okay? Uh, those people over study periods, over a five-year period in particular, were 50% less likely to die 
than the people who were kind of aimless and not feeling like they had a direction. So protective, like purpose is protective of your mm-hmm. mortality. And so let's go back though to sizing this prize because I was at a panel discussion yesterday at the Wharton Women's Summit, Wharton School of Business, you know, and these women, they're just like, like just going to start these really great careers. And, and one of the biggest topics people were raising their hand to talk was, what if I don't know my purpose? Like what? And I'm, you know, I'm not telling them that they're going to die if they don't have a purpose because they're going to figure that shit out. But the pressure to feel like your purpose needs to be magnanimous. Oh my gosh. Like, can we just stab that in the throat? Like purpose can be something that is just beautifully simple. And like, I worked with a woman recently who came to this conclusion and she's like, my purpose in life is to just make every person that I come across feel like a million bucks. Like I want to make them feel good about themselves. And so every interaction she has in her job as a corporate bigwig, she just wants people to feel great. Her team, her aunt, Mm -hmm. her whoever, like I've decided one of my main purposes in life is to make my dad feel like the best dad in the world. And like, that's not going to save children in Africa. That's not going to save the water crisis, but it doesn't matter. You know, is there some reason that you get up and feel like this is my reason? And so that's protective. That's going to help us live longer, whether it's a socially acceptable purpose or not. You know, Mm -hmm. like, can I ask, can I be nosy or and say, like, can I get you you and say, like, what are some of your purposes? Jody, you don't have to ask me. This is the second time, second or third time you've asked permission. You don't have to ask permission. (laughs) Believe me, if I don't want to do something, I'll just let you know. <laughs> Love it. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. You, so the question was, what's, what's your purpose or plural uh, purposes? Okay. The first purpose has to do with uh, me and what, and I have a morning ritual I go through. Um, and I, I won't say I'm hundred uh, percent on this, but one of the, the, the questions that I ask myself uh, is what do I need to do to be a better version of myself today than I was yesterday? Cool. Okay. So that, that's, and you know, I, I, I think I might mention, I have a men's coaching program. And one of the, the things that I talk about in the program is that the most important relationship a person has is with themselves. Okay. If, if, if that, you know, if you have a, a horrible conversation, and, and Jordan Peterson actually talks about this, uh, if you have a horrible conversation in your head about yourself, you're screwed. You're, you're, you're screwed because if you don't have a good conversation with yourself, a good relationship with yourself, you can't have a good relationship with anyone else. Mm-hmm. Okay, so, so, so that, that's one is, 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 is for me to have a, a good uh, relationship with myself. Uh, my other purpose is to be uh, a good husband. Mm-hmm. Okay, that, that's very important to me, uh, to be supportive and loving of my wife. My wife works very hard. She, uh, my wife sells uh, mid market, uh, middle market companies. Mm-hmm. So she does mergers and acquisitions. So her, her, her job goes from zero stress to monster stress <laughs> and, the closer, and the closer that millions of dollars change hands, the, the, the more stress that there is. Uh, and, and so, uh, and so to, to be supportive in that and, and her other th- things that she wants to do in her life. Uh, my other purpose is to be a good father. And I have, I have two daughters. Fortunately, they're both out of college and they're, they're gainfully employed and none of them ever has, has any interest of ever coming back and living with us. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're, 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 I mean, they're, they're doing, they're, they're doing incredibly well. Um, and, uh, it, we're fortunate that we did not get, my wife and I did not get, we did not get us as kids, uh, because we were horrible kids. And, uh, and, and I, I've told my daughters that, that they're screwed because it skips a generation. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then the other, my, my other purpose is, is, uh, my coaching program, uh, to make a difference in men's lives and, and my podcasts. And then I, then I have stuff that, you know, you know, that I do. Uh, yes, I do like to have my scotch or my vodka. I do like to have my cigars. Uh, I do like to uh, exercise. I do like to do other things and stuff like that. Yeah. So, so the, those are my, my biggest purposes, but it really, it, it has to start and this, it sounds selfish, but it's not, it has to start with your relationship with yourself. 
Amen. I, I completely agree. Yeah, the stories we tell ourselves will either, yeah, they'll build us up and make us better for other people, or it'll just, yeah, it crumbles us before we even begin. I, yeah. I'm right on, I'm right with you as a coach. Yeah. And, and I think there's also a, a, a very big need to be honest with yourself. Mm. You know, you know, you, you can't, you don't, don't, don't lie to yourself. Don't lie to yourself about, uh, you know, about, about things. And um, the other thing I also discuss about my program is don't get stuck in the, in the rut of you should be doing this. Oh. Okay. You know, uh, just because, just because people say you should be doing this and that you, doesn't mean you have to do that. Matter of fact, you, you really do stuff you want to do. And yeah. uh, we also spend a lot of time on figuring out uh, the most important thing is uh, like uh, Simon Sinek. I think he's got, he's got, he's got it wrong. If the, you don't start with why you start <laughs> with what, once you get the what, then you go to the why. <laughs> oh, that's so good. That's so good. You know, this comes back to something we chatted about a few minutes ago around when people have near death experiences or even just, just the, even the slightest brush. And I know you didn't go to get to the precipice of death, but um, the people that I work with who are the most on fire in their lives. And more importantly, back to the point we're making here, that have the most clarity about like what actually matters, like what their priorities are going to be out mm -hmm. of the 912 that could be on their list that they might be shooting themselves about. I should do that. I should. When when I'm thinking about what, um, one gentleman who recovered from prostate cancer, had his prostate removed, like life changes, and he now has this, I'm selling my business. I'm, I'm going to start. And he's got this whole, this whole plan ahead about getting involved in the arts community where he lives, spending quality time and going and visiting his son overseas. And it really does crystallize the shit that matters. And it helps to sift aside the stuff that we fill ourselves with these beliefs, like I'm supposed to be doing X, Y, and Z. And we get caught up in that whole treadmill mm -hmm. and, you know, it can be generally serving, but imagining and here's the thing it's, I don't want us to have to go through the drama of having to have a really terminal crap illness or to have to have a near death moment. Like let's wake up to life before we have to go through that. Cause most of us won't even be given the gift actually of a near death experience. So let's imagine it, let's get vivid. And there's cool research out there that if you get almost bizarrely vivid with imagining your death. So there's even a, there's even um, research about this idea that you they, they give um, study participants a story that they had to read about being in a very graphic, vividly imaged apartment fire. They're like, you're visiting a friend, you're staying over. It's the 30th floor of the building. You smell fire, you see smoke, flames are engulfing you and you actually die. And they even go into more detail. I mean, I find it so amusing. But that's the thing then that they actually researched and found out that those people in the study afterwards were so much more grateful for their life. Of course, just even compared to people who were generally reminded of the idea of death, which is where we, we usually softball it. We usually mm -hmm. like even counting your Mondays. I'm going to be honest. That's like a fucking yeah. softball. That's like, yeah, let's just throw some numbers around and get you thinking. And believe me, like it's way better than doing nothing, which is la, 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 sure. not thinking or talking about it. But the more vivid you can get. And I even encourage like, do this with your friends or family, like do it with your wife. And I'd be like, let's go, let's be willing to do this bizarre visualization, but let's do it. Feel the gripping of, oh shit, feel that feeling in order to wake up to life. Cause that's mm -hmm. the thing then that goes, wait a minute, why am I toiling with that part of my business? Like, is this really the way I want to be spending my next 412 Mondays? Mm -hmm. No, and it helps you to get clear. Like my client, I told you about with prostate cancer. He's like, I like the literal expression of life's too short, but now he sees life is too short to squander it doing anything that anything other than lights me up. Yeah. You know, I, I think that that's so, so important. There's a lot of times, um, you know, going back to the, to the should have, I've, mm -hmm. I've, I've told my kids, I'm not perfect, mm -hmm. but far from it. And there are things that, I should be doing differently, but the reality of it is, I don't want to. <laughs> you, good for you. What's an example? Yeah, pardon me. What's well, an example? Oh, I'm, I'm I'm smoking cigars. You know, uh -huh. you know, people people will go a little smoking. I you know I have, uh, probably two, maybe three cigars a week. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I remember this, this was when my kids were real small. Uh, I was smoking cigars with another guy, 
And he was just so worried that his kids were going to see him smoking a cigar. I mean, they're playing in our backyard. I, oh, what the hell? What the, you know, my kids see me smoking a cigar all the time and they're not smoking cigars. Oh, I did have to teach my youngest daughter how to smoke a cigar because she, um, we talked about how a, a, lot, a lot of deals get done in cigar bars. You know, a lot of businesses, it's, it's like a golf course in some ways. So a lot, and so we, she's, she's in business and we were talking and, and she, she just looked at me and she goes like, if I was a boy, you would have already taught me how to smoke mm -hmm. a cigar. She was, well, she was 21 at the time. <clears throat> and, 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 and I, 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 I hid behind my wife for a while because my wife didn't want me to take care of. And then once, once my wife heard that, uh, then she goes like, yeah, you need a good teacher. Smoke. And it's not like, she, you know, she, the only time she smoked a cigar was just when she's with me. Uh, yeah. But, but uh, you know, it, it, I, I, there was a whole, there's a whole ritual about smoking a cigar in terms of how you cut it, how you light it. Yes. Uh, it, 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 it's, uh, uh, it's, it, 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 it's, yeah, it's, uh, you know, uh, was it, uh, my, my, my oldest daughter said my cigar box is, is like a, it's, it's the guy's version of a jewelry box. <laughs> oh my gosh. You, have to, you and my husband will get along just great. Yeah. He's, yeah. And he's like all excited. So he's back in Palm Springs today. He's like, I'm going to go to the store and maybe get like, he's got like so many lined up, but the act of going and searching and getting a new one is also very. Special. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's a lot of yeah. fun. Yeah. So, so Jody, let me ask you, um, you're obviously, you know, you're very, uh, have a, a a great outlook on life. Okay, you know, you, you know, you're, you're embracing it and, and living it to uh, to its fullest in, in a lot of ways. But I imagine you must have dark days. Yeah. Okay, tell us about the dark days, and uh, how do they show up, and how do you cope mm. with them? Yeah. Well, I am hyper aware that I can be a total hypocrite. So I espouse, I get on stages. I love to motivate people to live life fully. Although even though I am, I, I'm always careful to do a, uh, you know, living wider and deeper. We can talk about that in a minute if you want to, but like, sure. it doesn't need to be a life that is so showy, right? Cause I don't think that's sustainable, but so regardless, I, I do recommend living life. Like we mean it, whatever that means for us. So it's mm -hmm. relative. And I, and, and, and I think some people then um, assume that I am therefore living a life that is wide and full of vitality and deep with meaning and that I've somehow got it nailed. And I find myself, maybe, maybe part of the reason that I work on this is because I need help. Like I am my number one client daily mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is because I have tendencies where I'm introverted. I don't act like it on stages or when I'm in groups and teams, people would never know it, but I just, I just love to be alone or with the husband and the cat. I am a homebody. And so my default setting is actually very narrow and comfortable and home. And I'm going to describe something that may absolutely bore you to tears and perhaps some of your listeners. And so trust me, I will make it brief because I don't want to bore anybody to tears or death, but it's like a Friday night anticipating through the day, thinking about, Ooh, we're going to order pizza and we have a special movie on our minds. We're going to watch on the couch with a great bottle of wine. Like that to me is a life well lived. Mm -hmm. So what I am hyper aware of is that my tendency is often to just keep narrowly burrowing into this home space that yes, it's great. And yet there's more. And so I also have lots of interest. I am very interested in things like, like going out for a tasting menu or traveling or visiting friends or doing different things. For me, it might be in, it's like in the right dosage, mm -hmm. but I have to stop. And I recognize in myself because I get so consumed with work. Fortunately, I enjoy it, but I have to stop and look around every now and then and go, okay, wait a minute. <laughs> am I, I am so not a poster child right now for vitality. Like I actually would embarrass myself if people saw maybe my social calendar or what I'm up to. And I have to stop. And literally, like if there was a record, like, er, like I have to stop it and design all of a sudden. I have to stop mm -hmm. and say, plan, make a reservation for dinner. Go yeah. make a plan, like go and plan to visit Madison and um, my friend and was in, um, in Michigan. Like, put it in the books because if it happens, if it's in my calendar, it's going to happen. I have good intentions. Yeah. This is the thing with a lot of our lives, right? We have all these great ideas about stuff we want to do, 
things, hobbies we want to pick up, languages to learn, places to visit, but they're all just good intentions unless you actually like make a plan to make it happen. So that's where I, I know that's my, like my, yeah. my fatal flaw. Yeah, so. Thank you for joining Dr. Orist and his incredible guest. Like what you heard and learned? Then be sure to do three things. One, subscribe so you don't miss the next episode. Two, share this with someone who may need to hear it. Three, leave a review and rate this podcast. Opt in at www.thestandard.academy forward slash magazine and get our free digital magazine with savings, articles, and deeper dives into cool controversy. Be the guy who takes action. Without action, you're not going to get the results you want. Thank you again and make it a great day.